Good. Hello, everybody. My name is Shefen Mbewe. I'm from Zimbabwe, born and raised up in Zimbabwe. My parents were from Malawi, so I'm an immigrant son. My parents were immigrants in Zimbabwe, farm laborers in Zimbabwe. Now, um, I'm with YWIM, and I live here in England. Um, I'm part of YWIM, YWIM Front Emissions. I've been with YWIM for 26 years now. And um, my friend Fred and I are going to be discussing uh, issues of rest. And we call this um, talk, Healed Hearts Discuss Rest. So I want to start by just explaining what I mean by healed hearts. There's a lot of pain and sorrow and grief around this issue of racism. And um, there's also a lot of anger and frustration. There's also despair because sometimes people don't even know what to say or what to talk about. And um, sometimes people don't want to even talk about it. Some people are already talking about how they are just so overwhelmed. They don't want to even look at anything that talks about and the rest, either on social media or in the news. So what I mean by healed hearts is that um, when a person like myself or Fred, when our hearts are healed, and the healer here, by the way, is God himself through the Lord Jesus Christ, when he has healed our hearts, there is a sense in which there is no subject which is a taboo. There is no subject that we say we can't talk about. Because when he heals us, he takes away the anger. When he heals us, he takes away the bitterness. When he heals us, he makes us new. He makes us new people. We are a new creation. So this is a subject we can talk about freely without any pain. I will share some of my stories from the past. And when I share those stories, I promise you, you don't need to feel sorry for me because there is no pain anymore. There is memories, but the sting is gone. I, I can tell those stories, sometimes even laugh at some of the things that happen because the sting is gone. But the idea is that we as Christians can have a platform or a table where anyone can sit and we can have an open, honest discussion about racial issues so that we pave the way for the future. There is a verse in the Bible that really struck me about this, which is also one of the reasons why I really felt this was important and needed to be done. And it's a verse in Ephesians chapter 3, in verse 10, where the Apostle Paul says, through the church, God wants to make known his manifold wisdom through the church. Now, you know that Churches are closed right now. Churches are just building. So really what this scripture is saying is that through us, through God's people, God wants to make known his manifold wisdom. In other words, God, who is the God of wisdom, has so much wisdom that he wants to make known to the world. And if that wisdom is not going to be known if we Christians keep quiet, if we Christians keep our mouths shut. So if we speak, we are making the wisdom that God has revealed in his word, known to the world or known according to this text of scripture to principalities and powers. So this is what we're going to do this afternoon. And um, Fred is here. We will have a kind of conversation discussion where we uh, ask each other questions or answer questions. But we are really hoping that by the end of this session, there will be enough dialogue or conversation happening that sets everyone free who might be walking around with the burden of what do I do with this issue of racism today? Fred, you want to say something? Yes, thank you, Shefan. I'm Fred from South Africa. And uh, Shefan and I are together part of the International Frontier Missions Leadership uh, of YWAM. And it's such a privilege. I've known Shefan for a long time, I think. In 1998, when we started in Mozambique, uh, I met Shefan, and it's really been a wonderful journey uh, to get to know him. So today, we want to talk as friends, and we want to talk openly with one another. And we're also talking here on the, on the YWAM FM page, 
And I think our whole hearts as YWAM FM is really for the injustice of those who've never heard the gospel. Uh, it's so unjust that a third of the people of the world have never ever had a, pre a clear presentation of the gospel in their own language. And that's our hearts. Uh, but that's not the only injustice in this world. And I think this injustice that we're talking about today, racial injustice, is a big thing and it's a big topic now. But Chef, and I have to say for many people, this is an uncomfortable topic to speak about, you know. Um, I read it, we, in our small group, we are doing the story of Jonah. And uh, it's amazing, the story of Jonah in the end, uh, where he had this comfort of the shade and it was taken away. And he got angry at God because of his comfort being taken away. And God called him out and showed him that he's more concerned about his own comfort than about the, the people that are different from him, another people group and God's pity on a people. And I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to, because it feels uncomfortable, steer away from conversations where, where God is in this. And um, so what would you say to someone that says, why do we want to, why do we need to talk about this? Thank you, Fred. And that's a really excellent question. Um, well, we need to talk about it so that we, we can get out of our comfort zones. You know, I've been very encouraged. While some of us are, you know, it's so easy to look at this as a massive crisis. It's also a tremendous opportunity uh, or a moment of opportunities as well. I've been so encouraged by so many people who have said to me, I have learned something that I didn't know. And thankfully, these are people who have stepped out of their comfort zone into something and say, you know, I want to find out what's behind all this. So for that reason alone, uh, this kind of comfort is necessary. I think we, we've been way too, comf too comfortable for too long and it's not right because as you said, the injustices have been there going on for so long. Um, I love watching football and I was watching highlights of the Manchester City um, Arsenal game. And then at the end, the, the Manchester City coach was asked about what he thought because all the players were wearing Black Lives Matter on their, on their shirts instead of their usual uh, names. And the, the Pep Guardiola, the coach, was asked, what do you think? And he said, um, it, it's, it's about time. This has gone on for far too long. He said, we're talking about 400 years here of in, an in, injustice to... To the, to the black people and we can't carry on like that. So why did we wait for this long to say something? So it's an uncomfortable conversation that we must have. We must have it also so that we prepare the next generation, Fred, so that it's easier for them. So if this generation doesn't deal with it, it will always be an awkward conversation for the next generation because we, had, we hadn't dealt with it properly. So. They say, we need to get rid of this short-sightedness, hoping that you know, if we close our eyes long enough and we are quiet long enough, it will go away and we'll go back uh, to business as usual. You know, I'm sitting here, Fred, and I don't think for a minute that it's coincidence that this is happening in the same year that we had the COVID-19 thing, which stopped the whole world. So while the whole world was frozen, waiting, what's going on? Boom, this thing comes in. I don't think it's a coincidence. We need to see what God is doing here, but not more than that. We need to jump in and be proactive. I am very concerned for Christians to give leadership to this topic, for their voices to be heard more than anybody else, because I believe that God wants us to be the head, not the tail, um, because it, it has uh, implications in how we relate with one another. It is about loving our neighbor. It is about reaching out to the marginalized. It's about going out to find the one ship that is lost while you have 99 comfortable fat ship in the pen, but you leave those and you go and look for the one that is lost. It's about, you know, those that are on the fringes of society, those that we don't see every day. And once it's open, then we need to discuss it. Lastly, Fred, I'll just say, you know, Martin Luther, the reformer, used, used to say, if the gospel does not address the issues of the day, 
then it is not the gospel at all. So here is a very serious issue. When COVID-19 hit, how many church leaders put out messages about you know, the gospel and COVID-19, church and COVID-19? You know, we had all kinds of messages trying to help us negotiate the times in which we are living in with COVID-19. And here we are now with this issue of racism. And what we're, all we're trying to do is keep quiet. No, we need to speak out. And I want to see more and more message about, you know, the gospel and racism, you know, the truth of scripture and racism being taken apart or being explained by people who are mature in who they are so that, you know, we prepare the next generation for how they're going to negotiate this delicate issue. Wow. Uh, Stefan, we also have a live audience on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook Live, and we want to engage with them as well. So please, if you have comments, and uh, we don't want to go on too long, but if you have questions, put them there. Abner will put them on, on the screen for us. I tried to access the Facebook page, but I can't now with the internet. So uh, please write it there. Abner will put it on. If there's a specific question, then we can try to see if we can get to it. Um, but we want to hear from Chef and we want to hear his story. So I want to encourage you, invite your friends. Uh, if you are on live and there's someone, wow, I wish this person were here, was here or this person needs to hear this, invite them now. Let them be part of this. And uh, then uh, we, can, we can see uh, how we can address those issues together and wrestle with them in a friendly way. And I think uh, this is what needs to happen, Chef, and that we talk. And I agree yeah. with you so much. You know, this is a time of shaking. And I think spiritual strongholds are falling <laughs> and things are coming to the forefront. And this is definitely a spiritual issue. I grew up in South Africa during the apartheid time where it was normal to go to an all-white school. Uh, everybody in our church, everybody uh, that we are friends with are from the same culture and the same color than me. And, uh, you know, we didn't see anything wrong with it. It was only after it fell that our eyes opened and we realized how wrong we were thinking. Uh, so it's definitely a spiritual stronghold that, that needs to be addressed spiritually. But as you say, the gospel is very practical uh, and it needs to touch our lives on a daily basis. It's not something in our heads. Um, so we, one thing that I've been feeling is that we really need to listen. There's a cry, uh, there's a lot of anger, a lot of hurt, and we need to listen to understand. As someone who does not have a black skin, I need to, to hear and listen to my brothers so that I can try to understand what this is about. So, Chef, tell us your story. Let's take some time to just tell us where you come from, how, how have you been touched uh, by this issue through your whole life? I'm sure it, it didn't start now during the corona time. No. <laughs> no, thanks, Fred. That's a good question. In Zimbabwe, I grew up on a farm, Fred, and um, uh, the farmer was Africans, uh, Swan Poel. His name was Swan Poel, J.J. Swan Poel. Uh, my father had worked for his father, and then when this young man reached an age where he could be independent, which was about in, in, in Zimbabwe, Rhodesia at that time would have been about 19 or 20, he was uh, given my father to teach him how to grow tobacco, cotton, and maize. My father was a specialist in those, in those things. So I grew up on a farm, and um, this man was very, very short-tempered, very, very angry man. We could hear him about a mile down the road shouting at the top of his voice to some, you know, Af the African farmers when he got angry. I saw beatings, um, you know, when the African man made a mistake at work and he turned up and he was angry, we would be there working, helping our parents, and I saw men being beaten. Um, they, he had a son who was about my age and very lonely on the farm, and I was asked several times to go and play with him because he needed friends. But I had to call this boy who was my age, I had to call him Bass. You know that word, Fred, Bass, which means boss. You know, and he was same age as me, you know, eight or nine at that time. Um, later on, the farm was sold to a different farmer, but, you know, I had already seen a shooting, you know, someone was shot and killed for fishing in the river. Um, during, around that time, that the, before this farmer went away, uh, my brother, uh, one of my brothers grew his hair, you know, afro, you know, big like this. 
because this was this was the seventies, the time of the, the Jackson Five. So you know, he was was just following the trend at that time, but he was stopped at the police roadblock that was manned by mainly white policemen, and it had his hair plucked off with a pliers because they say to him, you are imitating, you know, Michael Jackson. Do you think this is America? You know, you must be listening to American music. You, do you think, you know, who do you think you are? Because he wasn't allowed to do that. My older brother left the farm to go and work, work in the city because he was working as a gardener or the proper word in, in those days was garden boy. And uh, in the bushes somewhere, he was listening to the music of the Beatles. That, was, that used to be called white music. You were not allowed to listen to white music. And so he was working, you know, again, uh, farms in Africa, Fred, a big farmhouse with a big garden. Somewhere in the bushes, he's got music playing and he forgot. He went to work away to work on the other end of the farm, on the other end of the farmhouse or the garden. So the farmer then walked past and he had this music playing in a little transistor radio in the bush tuned to what was called the white station. It was actually a South African station. Well, he got a serious beating. And that's when my brother, my, my brother fled to go to Harare to go and look for work in the factories in Harare. But you couldn't travel without a pass. You know, if you wanted to go somewhere, you need to find a pass, someone, you know, your, your boss to write you a pass and say, you know, this person, I know this person. He can, if you were caught by the police without a pass, you're in trouble. Our house was raided by soldiers almost every night, searching our home to find out if we had you know, food that was sufficient for us. If they found food more than we, we, we were supposed to have, then we were supporting the terrorists because this was when the civil war was going on in Zimbabwe, right? So I grew up with that sort of thing, you know, police beatings. And there were sections of the town we were not even allowed to walk on the pavement, you know, coming back from school. Um, one of the most horrible experiences for me from that time was when the farm had changed hands. A new farmer, a new white farmer had come and he had, um, he had four boys. And these boys, at this, I think I was about 12 years at this time. And one day I was walking near the farmhouse and these boys saw me and uh, let their dogs loose on me. And you know, these dogs, we honestly, we used to believe that those dogs were racist because they would always go for us as, as Africans, okay? So they came for me and attacked me, knocked me over, ripped my clothes off. I was wearing my, you know, my favorite khaki shorts and khaki shirt, ripped them off completely. I ran home completely naked, my clothes I mean, crying. Um, my mother was distraught, she didn't know what to do. I was so traumatized by that experience, Fred. Right up to my late uh, 20s, I had a, a fear of dogs that you couldn't explain. I just needed to hear a dog barking and I would be shaking, you know, in, in, in my, in, you know, shaking within me. So, so those are some of the things that I grew up with. You know, schools were limited, you know, reading or if, if the little schools that were there had no um, resources. That's what I grew up with. Um, until, you know, when, when the farm changed the hands again, so it was, you know, bought by missionaries. But until that time, that was my experience of the relationships between whites and blacks. So by the time that I was, say, you know, 14, 15, 16, I was an angry young man because of all these things that I'd experienced, all these things that I'd seen. I never believed that I could be friends with a white person. In fact, I didn't. I never believed that there's any white person who genuinely loves black people or can be friends with black people. And I wasn't the only one. That was our experience. There was a whole generation that was wounded racially in that respect. So, do you want me to tell you how the story then changed from there when I went to YWAM? Okay. So, in I went to join YWAM. And in between, there had been uh, some tensions while I was growing up. There, was been, there had been some tensions. Even when I became a Christian, there were some tensions, especially related to me going out with Caitlin and wanting to marry Caitlin. So I left to go, on, to go and do my course with Wyom, very angry again, although I had been a Christian, but now very angry thinking, you know, I'm not allowed to marry the person I want to marry. And this is so unjust. This is so unfair. And uh, I didn't know much about YWAM. So I arrived in, at the YWAM center in Bulawayo, 
hoping that there will be no white person there because I was just fed up. I thought this is an opportunity for me to go and learn about the word of God. And I don't, I don't want to let, I don't want to, I don't want anything to do with um, white people anymore. But lo and behold, the first person to meet me there was a, an African's guy, who was a Zimbabwean of Africans called Corny Haynes. And he gave me the warmest welcome you could ever imagine. And my head began to spin, thinking, what is going on here? I thought I was running away from white people. You know, who is this guy? And uh, my small group leader was Mandy Dreyer. You know, again, very friendly, very welcoming, another South African. Um, so one of the things that really impacted me was that we ate together, black and white, in the dining hall. We sat together and ate in the same place. I had never seen this all my life. I think it was two or three days of being at this place that I was going up, you went up the stairs to go up to the uh, boys' dormitories. And through the kitchen window, I saw Connie Haynes, my leader, cleaning up after us, washing this massive uh, saucepan, which had been used to make um, uh, sadza or uh, maize meal. And he was busy scrapping it. And I stopped to look and I thought, wow, I've never seen this before. I had never seen a white person cleaning. You know, white people that I'd known always had house boys, house girls, you know, who did all their dirty work. You know, to me, white people were always masters. And here was this guy who was supposed to be my leader and he was cleaning. I remember when I went into my dormitory, I, went, I wrote in my journal just one line, God is in this place and I know it. In my heart, there was a hunger and a desire that what is happening here, I want to know exactly what, what is operating. There's something, there's a different spirit functioning here that I want to really know, right? Then during a process of being taught, especially the subject on, on um, uh, divine inner healing um, through Les Fener, another South African, um, this is where all my anger that I was trying to hide inside and trying to be a good Christian, my anger and frustrations of over all the years, which had not been touched. See, this is another reason why we should never keep quiet. We need to bring these things out in the open. So all these wounds that were in my heart that I thought time will heal. And, you know, the more you don't talk about it, the more it will get better. No, I was becoming, I had a chip on my shoulder. I was an angry person. If I had a tiny little bit of a racial comment, the, the anger was triggered. Either how would resp I would respond or and, and, you know, want to start a fight or I would just turn away and write you off because, Fred, you said something I didn't like. That's how angry I was because the issues had never been dealt with. But now they are being dealt with in the context of this week of teaching and I'm beginning to realize that there was no way I could grow because I had all these injuries, all these hurts, I had all this pain. And I began to open up and share. When I shared, Connie Haynes stood up and came to me and said, Shefan, I want you to forgive me for all the horrible things that white people have done in this country. And he began to list them. He said, I'm speaking as a white Zimbabwean. I know that we have treated you badly, racially. I know that we have devalued you and belittled you or, uh, and you know, abused you. I know that you, know, you have been, had, you've had dogs let loose on you. And he listed all these things. That some of them I had mentioned them, but some of them he knew that was life in Rhodesia. That was life in He knew. So he began to list all these things. And he said, I want to say to you, I'm sorry for all those things. Will you forgive me? Fred, I looked at him. I knew in my heart that there was no other option other than to respond and say, yes, I forgive you, because his apology was sincere. He meant it. So I stood up and looked at him and said, Con, I forgive you. The moment I said those words, it was as if a weight had just come off my shoulder. You know, it was like as if my chains just fell off. I felt a freedom in the spirit inside me that I had never felt before. You know, I tell people that, you know, even looking outside, the colors, the, you know, the trees were in the grass was greener than I'd ever noticed before. You know, I could hear the birds in a much more clear sound than I did. It was just like a new thing that happened to me. This is why I believe that there is healing in confession for both. 
So for Cohen, when he confessed those words on behalf of his people and apologized, there was healing for him. But also those words of apology said in humility brought healing to my own heart because God could use those words. And suddenly I was a changed person. So I look back and in a strange way, I could thank God for the missionaries who had stopped me from marrying Caitlin, from marrying my wife, because I knew that if I had married her with a heart that was wounded like that, Fred, it was going to be a disaster. There was just so much pain. And I was going to take out that pain on Caitlin. So God in his wisdom had allowed this, what to me was a really awful situation. He had allowed it for me to get healing first before I can even serve him and before I can even begin to think about what does it mean to marry somebody and live with somebody cross-culturally. So that's, that's part of my story. That's where, that's where I am now. But that's why I believe very strongly in the power of confession. So God is looking for men or women here, friend, black and white. The white ones who are humble, who are not going to make excuses, who are not going to justify racism, who will be like corn, who will speak and just say, listen, we know what happened. It was wrong. I'm sorry for what happened. Then he's also looking for black men and women who will hear those words and extend forgiveness and say, I receive your apology. And both these positions require humility. Because if, if I'm humble and you are humble, there is no way we are going to clash. But if you justify your actions and say, oh, it happened in the past, you know, why are you putting that on me? Or, oh, get over it. I had one guy say to me, how old were you when Ian Smith was, was prime minister in Rhodesia? And I told him, he said, so you can't have experienced racism. You know, that's beside the point. I, in, in this case, I did experience anyway. He was wrong in his, in his understanding of what the events were like. I experienced racism. You don't need to justify it, Fred, and say, that happened, get over with it. You need to humble yourself. I think the world is desperately waiting to see humble men and women who reach out to one another to bring this healing that God wants to heal, to bring through the ways that we speak because there is power in our words. Wow. Um, this, this is quite tough. I hope the people are continuing to listen and we want to engage with our online community that are live. Please engage with us in this. And uh, even if it's a bit uncomfortable, I think it's so good to hear uh, Chef and, and hear his story. Thank you so much, Chef. Um, obviously, you know, when I was born, when I found out I was white, I didn't choose it. I can't mm. change it. And many times white people feel a lot of shame or condemnation when uh, people of color start sharing their hurts. But also we are different in so many ways. And you're talking about things in the past and many people say, oh no, but that was long time ago, you know? Now things are different. And I think in YWAM where we are, we have such a privilege to have friends cross-culturally, but not everybody has that. Um, can you just help us understand for me as a white person who is not black, uh, what is it like today in 2020 to live in this world? What is different? What, what makes it difficult, these racial issues? What is the anger really about? I, I think and that's another excellent question, Fred, because I think these things are transmitted generationally as well. So there are attitudes and things that are passed on from one generation to another. Part of the anger that I lived with myself had come from the fact that my grandfather had served in the Second World War. He had fought in North Africa. He got nothing for that other than a bicycle and a job in the police force, which you know, later he was, um, he was fired or he, they got rid of him because he was getting older and he ended up working on the farms, nothing. I used to hear these stories from my grandmother and you know what they did to me? They just, um, reinforce this sense of I'm inferior to white people because the same 
group of men who fought in the World War, in the Second World War, for all the whites, whites who came back, they were uh, rewarded with massive farms, massive pensions, very secure jobs wherever they wanted to go and work. So for a person growing up afterwards, um, then someone saying things in ignorance because I don't know how this affects you, you know, or why are you so angry? That ignorance is almost more hateful than the actual racism because what you are, what you are speaking into is you're speaking negative words into my issues here that I'm carrying. Um, I have often said to people, you know, when I, you know, that story that I shared about Corn Haynes, Corn Haynes could have come to me, Fred, and said, sort out your anger, sort out your inferiority complex, get over it. You know, this is a new day. You are hanging on to the past. You need to forgive. Would you have been wrong? No. <laughs> but was it going to help me? No. So, everybody has a part to play to make sure that the wounds of the past are opened up properly and cleaned so that proper healing can take place. So to a young person, listen to me now, who said, but I've never even been racial against somebody. How does this affect me? Uh, if you are white, I want you to know that you can play a part in just being able to come along somebody who is hurting. Again, this is one of the reasons why I, why I want this conversation to be an open conversation. Because you can say, listen, I may not, well, the, the key word here, let me use this word, the word is empathy. The key word is empathy. So you say, I may not have experienced it, but I can, I can at least try to understand what you're talking about. To, uh, to explain what empathy is, Fred, I use a story from a, 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 an incident that took place at my church one day. A little girl, came downstairs when we were all having lunch and um, she was crying her head uh, uh, out because she had fallen and grazed her knee very badly. It so happened that her grandmother was there as well with us. And the grandmother said to her, oh, what happened? And this little girl began to explain how she had been pushed by uh, one of her friends and she had knocked, uh, knocked, was knocked over, fell and grazed her knee badly. I will never forget this friend because the grandmother got down on her knees to her level and got close to her and looked her in the eye and said, oh, and she called out her name and said, oh, that must hurt. You know, I remember her words were genuine. She, she, she meant it. She meant that she understood that if you graze your knee, surely it must hurt. So she was able to communicate that empathy. And I remember the little girl stopping crying and explaining how sore it was, but the crying had stopped. She could explain, yes, it's so painful. That's what I call empathy. Brian Stevenson, who wrote a book called Just Mercy, and there's a lot of stuff online about what this guy is doing in the US, especially to try and help a lot of disadvantaged people who are condemned in, to death or are in prison, uh, accused falsely, amazing. Look out for it and look out for stuff that he's doing on, on, uh, on, um, on YouTube or online somewhere. He talks about the, the need to get closer to where the issues are. So I want to challenge white people to get closer. He, to, he used the word proximity. We can't be distanced. We need to learn. We need to find this empathy again where we can say, oh, man, I understand. You know, I posted a lot of stuff about George Floyd on my Facebook page, and someone asked me, do you know him? Why do you keep going on about him? Well, truth is, I don't know him. And also, truth is, America is far away from where I am now. But there is such a thing called empathy, and it's a God-given thing. Once we allow that thing to die in us, and we don't care anymore, we don't find tears, we can't cry, and we think, what's the fuss all about? There's a serious problem right there. Another example I tell to emphasize the, or to contrast the, emphasis, the em empathy or what some people may be going through here is another true story that I actually saw. Again, if people want to Google this, they'll find it online. You know, when John, John Lennon was killed in, in New York, in the USA, uh, this was one of the Beatles being interviewed. I think it was Ringo Starr. 
and he was being in an interview and he was asked, oh, how was it for you? He said, it was hard to lose one of our friends that we grew up with and we did all kinds of things together. And then, and then he went on to say, you know, I made the mistake of going to New York to try and comfort Yoko Ono, you know, John's widow. And um, he said, I made the mistake of reaching out to her and say to her, oh, Yoko, I know how it feels. And she kicked away his hand and said, she pushed away his hand and said, you don't. She got angry. Said, you don't know how it feels. And Ringo Starr, retelling the story years afterwards, said, you know, I look back and I realized that I was stupid because she was right. I had never lost a loved one. I didn't know how it felt. You know, Fred, this is one of the things that is causing a lot of Black's anger because there's a lot of people who are writing and commenting. We have no idea what it is like to be black and to suffer racial prejudice, but they write as experts. So I wanna say this, at this stage, when I'm hating like this, I don't wanna know what you know. I wanna know how much you care. I'll say that again. When someone is hating, they don't want to know how much you know. They want to know how much you care. And that is something that we can learn. So if as a white person, you have never understood what this is all about, educate yourself. There is a lot of stuff out there online. There's a lot of you know, movies, documentaries, find out. Um, another thing that you know, people haven't asked, but I wanna throw in this one right away. A lot of people are saying, I don't understand the anger. Yes, I know there is racial injustice, but I don't understand the rioting and the anger. And, you know, it's just one man who died, but look at what is happening and what's happening all over the world. Well, first of all, it's not just one man who died in such an unjust way. Again, you need to learn. You need to, you spend hours, probably you need to do that, spend hours just looking at a lot of videos of police brutality in the USA. And it's not just the USA, even here in the UK where I am. And it's not just the UK, we are talking about marginalized people wherever they might be found in the world. There's a lot of injustice. So educate yourself, find out, because you're going to discover that it's not just one event and the media is blowing it up. That's another excuse I've had. People say the media is blowing this thing up. They are focusing on this. And why, what about this? And afraid you'll be interested to know that someone said to me, there are so many white farmers being killed in South Africa. Why is the media not focusing on that? Again, that's another hateful thing because it's comparing two events or two situations that are not even similar. We are talking here of systemic, as Pep Guardiola, the coach for Manchester City said, something that has been going on for 400 years. Martin Luther King Jr. said, rioting or protesting is the language of the unheard. So, the, I understand, I don't support the anger and the violence that's going on in the protest, but I understand where it's coming from because I've been there. I know what it feels like for, to keep saying something and not be heard. And so what we have done, Fred, is it's like, you know, when you're at the table, you know, with friends, many people talking, having a meal, and the conversation is flowing nicely. Everybody's talking, you know, ruba, 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 ruba. And the little boy sitting with you at the table says, please, can you pass the butter? Nobody hears that request. You know, Ruba, Ruba, people are talking and they, please, can I pass the butter? Nobody hears them. Please, can I pass the butter? Nobody's listening. Please, can that boy in frustration stands up at the table, sits, uh, stands up on the, on the chair and screams at the top of his voice, please, can you pass the butter? And everybody stops and says, you are naughty. Go to your room. You know, that's exactly what some people are trying to do with this because we are not listening. You know, when I went out for the match with Black Lives Matter, there was somebody with a placard which said, you know, if you are not angry, you are not listening. And there's a little bit of truth in that. But we need to be able to listen. You do what that grandmother did. Get down on your knees. Get closer to the problem. Find out. Talk to friends. You know, find an African who can ask questions and say, tell me what you think. Now, here I'm exposing myself because what you're going to find is that not everybody has an experience like Kevin's. There are some people who are mild who are not even bothered about these things. So don't take just the opinion of one person, including me, but find out, you know, how does this affect you? Were you ever affected in this way? You know, I got a message from a friend of mine who is a black British person who said, I grew up with privilege. Some of the things that are going on, I'm only learning now that this is how 
black people have been treated here because that was never my experience. But boy, am I regretting for not being aware all this time? What's wrong with the way I was educated? So while I'm saying get closer to the problem, you are going to discover that all, not all black people have the same experience. So find out from different ones and how they are impacted by what is going on, but learn this thing called empathy so that at least you can say the right words. Even if you didn't have the right words to say, at least you can give a hug or at least you can cry together. To me, empathy means learning to weep with those that are weeping or mourning with those that are mourning, even though the events happen far away. Yes, and yeah, this, this is so important to hear. And I think we need to create more platforms where, where voices can be heard, voices of, of the people of color. Um, and, you know, we all have been called to love our neighbor. And actually, that story is a cross-cultural story. It was someone mm. from another tribe, uh, you know, the Samaritan uh, that came to love another person. And um, how do we do that? We need to learn from one another. And like you say, I think we need to converse about this. And uh, apathy and, and ignorance is so prevalent in, in our age. And I think in the social media world where we live, you can hear and subscribe to news that, that feed your beliefs uh, mm. and not hear the other side of the story. Mm. I have one, one more question because if we say we need empathy, what I see a lot on Facebook and uh, what a lot of white people write about is that the way this anger is manifested, if we see violence and looting and burning and destruction accompany a march like the Black Lives Matter, uh, that makes people scared, you know, <laughs> and yeah. very un And I understand what you are saying about where the anger comes from. But what would you say to a person like this who, who talks about the Marxism in Black Lives Matter, who, who talks about the violence, the looting and burning uh, uh, in these uh, manifestations and, and protests? What, what would you say about this? That's a good question, Fred. Um, when I went to March, I didn't know much about the origins or the full history of Black Lives Matter. Um, I, I went because I wanted to make a stand with everybody else in Liverpool that was going. Uh, only when I came back and I posted something on my Facebook page, that's when the backlash happened and people began to make comments about how they were Marxist and you know, some of them, some of the founders, the agenda orientations are dodgy and there's a Christian, what would I say to that? Um, and, and, and then I had, so try, I had to start trying to answer these questions. So my response, Fred, will be number one, let us say worst case scenario. Let us say they are all Marxist. That means their ideology is opposed to my Christian beliefs. So let us say they are enemies. I believe that it's the teaching of scripture that we have to love our enemies. And let's say the founders, you know, their sexual orientation is something that, again, maybe I disagree with. Um, and same thing, are they my enemies? If yes, then I'm, I'm supposed to reach out to them. I can only empathize and understand if I get close enough to hear what exactly the issues are. But I found that some of the, some of the labels, so this is another key thing there, because once you put a label on somebody, you are not going to hear them. All you're going to see or hear is the label you put there. It's interesting because in the, in the Black Lives Matter website, there is no word Marxist there. This is something that people are putting on there because <clears throat> we feel the need to label somebody so that we feel we understand them better. But actually, they, there is a, an element of prejudice, prejudice that comes with that. Because once I put that label on you, first, who's gonna take it off? Who's gonna remove the label I put on you? And I'm not going to be hearing you because I'll be thinking about, I'll be filtering everything through the the, 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 the greed of what I've, how I've labeled. So that's a concern that I have. Um, I, some of the things that have been said, I've said, openly said, for example, for example, the issues of Marxism, 
I don't see right now in my current situation where Marxism affects me. But I can tell you that racism affects me. I came to Liverpool in 2012. Fred, I've been racially profiled here in Liverpool. I've had issues, yes. Some of them subtle, some of them openly, where I'm thinking, wow, okay? So I haven't been affected by, by communism or Marxism. I've been affected directly. So to me, racism is a clear and present danger. Marxism may be in the future, but I don't see that. So my response is, it's clear that there is two things happening in the campaign. And I don't want to sound like I'm an apologist for Black Lives Matter here. But I see that there is two things. There is a movement, a grassroots movement that is driven by this desire for justice. Then there is a, another part of it which is ideological and trying to push a certain much bigger agenda. My own conviction as I speak to you is I, wanna, I will stand with those that are standing for injustice. I will stand with those that are standing for um, peace or for, you know, when I went to March, I, I, I had already decided that once I noticed any sign of um, um, violence or rioting, I would sneak away and walk away from it. Thankfully, the particular March I take, took part in, none of that happened. Across the river here, an area called Beckenhead, there was a Christian girl who went to the March when they were giving out the speeches, she went to the front and asked if she could say something. They gave her the microphone. She shared about her Christian convictions. She shared very strongly and very powerful about how the answer is only in Jesus. And then she asked if she could pray. Nobody said to her, no. She prayed. These are Marxists allowing someone to pray. It was beautiful. I think I've shared this um, clip with, uh, with some people because my point here is, if there is darkness in Marxism or in what these people are doing, that is the place where we need to shine the light. We don't condemn the darkness for being there. We need to step up and go and be the light there. You know, Jesus talked about two things, salt and light, which are powerful pictures of influence. These things are not going to happen when we barricade ourselves in, our, in the safety of our homes and say, we have nothing to do with that. So I'm praying, I'm hoping that Christians will be courageous enough to separate the, the because there's a lot of smoke, smoke screen, there's a lot of red areas. It's actually been proven that some of the people who are causing distractions are hired third, third party people who are going there to try and just confuse the real issues behind this. We need to know or find ways in which we separate those issues and we can support this movement, this momentum that is there so that we see justice. Already we are seeing some amazing things that are coming out of this already. Yeah, I, th I think it's so important that we distinguish. And like we, we have a proverb that say, you throw out the baby with the bath water. That's that right. We That's don't, right. That we don't do that, you know, uh, yeah. that we see there is an outcry. There are, there's a real hurt there and we need to hear that. And um, I think we also need to respond spiritually to that. You know, this is a spiritual mm -hmm. problem. And I think this is a time for us as Christian leaders to really stand up and try uh, to create a platform where we can talk about these things. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that we also engage it in prayer to tear down these strongholds and mm -hmm. uh, that we model and that we try to get closer to one another. So I am from South Africa, an Afrikaner, and a white person, and I cannot stand before God for every person one day. Each one will, will have to respond to God for his own sins. But we do see in the Bible, um, there are examples, and many of them, of Moses praying, of David, of Nehemiah, uh, of Isaiah. And even in the New Testament, where they speak up on behalf of their people and confess sins on behalf of their people. And really, Shefan, just the stories that you've, that you've told, I really, it really touches my heart. And I know, you know, as an Afrikaner and as someone from South Africa, my people have been part in hurting people and in this. So I want to come and stand before you as a black man today. 
And I just want to say, I'm so sorry. I want to recognize publicly that there is still something like racism in our day, that there is a lot of prejudice, that there is superior feelings in a lot of, of thinking in a lot of white people's minds, that there is something as structured and social injustice in this world, and that I have certain power just because of my white skin. And Sarah Linia calls it PowerPoints, and one of them is the lighter skin you have, people look at you differently. Like when I walked with my colleague Geraldo to the shop, they immediately thought I was his boss and not his colleague, just because he has a different color skin. Mm. So I think things like that, we need to acknowledge that white privilege exists. <laughs> And these things do exist in our world still today. Mm. And um, I want to stand as a white man and just want to say to you out of my heart, Chef, and as a black man, I'm so sorry. I want to ask your forgiveness and the forgiveness of, of the black people, just the hurts that we have caused. Please, would you forgive us? Because this didn't start today. It started a long time ago, but the hurts are still there today. Mm -hmm. And we can't stop asking forgiveness if there are still people hurting. And I want to come and, and just humbly be before you today as a white man and say, on behalf of white people, I just want to ask you, please forgive us. I'm so sorry that this happened. I cannot change the past, but I want to come and humbly say, please forgive us. This was wrong. This is still wrong. Thank you, Fred. I want to say to you that I receive your apology and um, I also want to release words of forgiveness. So I forgive you um, for all those things that happened. I know you, Fred. I know how you lived in Mozambique. You mentioned Geraldo and many others that you lived with in Mozambique. You identified with African people. I will never forget my visits to the area where you worked and your boys um, calling me Uncle Shefem. And it was with that childlike sincerity, they meant it. But I knew that it was coming from you and Paola, you affirming that I was your brother, therefore I was their uncle. So thank you for what you have said. I also pray or, and release forgiveness on, on you and all white people. We talked earlier on before we went live that we, I personally, as, an, as a black man, I don't want you to see, I, want, I don't want to see you walking with shame and guilt. I have a friend who wrote very eloquently, an English friend who wrote very, very eloquently that since these things happened, she has felt ashamed to be English. And those words touched me. Because it is not an accident that God created different people groups. He did it for a purpose because there is strength in our diversity. So I do not want you to walk with guilt and shame. My forgiveness means that you are released from that strong hold of guilt and shame. I want you to feel free to discuss this subject with me or with anybody. And I want you to be able to say, I have a brother, meaning me. And you can say, he has forgiven me. Therefore, I can talk to any black person about these issues too, because they are not far away from your experience. There is a verse that maybe also is appropriate to use here. That in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where Paul says God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And that verse ends by saying, and we have this ministry of reconciliation. So you have that ministry of reconciliation, Fred. I have that ministry of reconciliation. Together, we can extend this ministry to the rest of the world. This is why I started by saying, God is looking for a white man who is humble like you, because the humble, he will not despise. So he will lift you up. And God is looking for people who are willing to accept um, this apology and who are willing to walk in the forgiveness that Christ has given because we are all broken. If there is anything for us to take away in all this, we are all broken people. 
and only God can heal us. Only God can put us together. These issues are deep, but boy, is our God bigger than the depth of our despair to lift us up out of that. So thank you. I receive your apology, and I want you to receive the forgiveness that comes from Christ through me. Thank you. I receive that. And I think, uh, yeah, it's so wonderful to have brothers uh, uh, that are different from me, from different cultures, from with a different skin color. I think I've learned so much uh, from my friends all over the world that are different from me. And um, yes, I think let us pray. Let us, let us pray for one another and let us end of this time uh, really seeking the Lord because it's only possible through Jesus that we can forgive, that we can walk on, that we can walk away from our shame. He died for us. Uh, I don't know if there's any last thoughts from your side that you uh, want to engage with our audience today, Chef, and before we close in prayer. Yeah, I want to encourage them to look for um, Phil Vischer. Phil Vischer's very short 18-minute documentary about the American story. Um, it's very well done. Phil Vischer is the guy behind the VeggieTales. So those who are parents watching this will know about VeggieTales. He's the guy behind that. Um, these things are to educate ourselves so that we are never in a place where we say we don't know what to say or I don't understand this anger. But we can say words that bring healing. We can say words that help others to understand at least we know. Let me finish with this, friend. I think I may have said it, but in a different way. I found during this crisis of racial tensions that ignorance is more hurtful than the actual words or racial words or racial slurs or whatever. Because if someone says something in ignorance, they look innocent because they are ignorant. But the impression they are giving me, especially if it's someone who has been hurt, is that, boy, how can you say that when you are supposed to know that that's it for? Do you understand what I'm saying? So there is no need, there is no need today for anyone to continue in ignorance. There is so much good material that will inform us and educate us so that we are all able to pass on, as I say, to the next generation tools that help that will help them i wish 2020 will be known as that was the year in which a death blow was dealt on racism now i know that these are hard issues it's not going to come through a strong military or through a strong uh, president somewhere in another country this is a hard thing that's why we call this healed hearts the healer is god himself and he wants to heal those hearts that are hurting but all those hearts that hate others, but it will be good one day for this year to be known as that's when the real issues around this, this, um, uh, these tensions of rest were dealt with, not by Fred and Chapman, but this is when God really intervened and did, some, did something, but because we were talking. So folks, keep talking. Let's keep having a conversation because silence does not help anybody. Lord, we want to come and just stand before you together as brothers in unity. And uh, Lord, we just want to come and lift Shephan up to you. Thank you for the wisdom that you've given him. We want to lift up the black community to you in all over the world where people are hurting. And we just want to pray, uh, pray Lord, that you will hear their heart cry, that you will have uh, that you will pour your mercy on them. Lord. Um, and Lord, we want to pray also for uh, our white friends. Lord, help us to not have hard hearts. Help us to have understanding. Give us wisdom on how we can help our brothers through this process. And Lord, we pray that you will teach us how to love one another, that you will teach us how to pray for one another. And I just want to speak a blessing on Shefan. I want to speak a blessing on uh, the black community of South Africa, of Africa, and uh, all over the world. And 
And Lord, that your uh, glory will be shown through the people of all colors in this world. Lord, I pray for healing where the enemy is trying to divide. Lord, that you will bring brothers together in unity. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. I also pray a blessing on Fred and to all those who tuned in, who are watching. Um, God is the healer and he's here to heal us and help us every day to face these issues with a real positive attitude of victory because we are not victims. Amen. Yes, bless you, everybody. Uh, thank you, those uh, that have engaged with us, that has listened to us. Uh, it's longer than we hoped for, but I think it's so important to take time and not rush through these things and hear one another. So, Shefan, blessings to Caitlin and your daughters. See you again sometime. Take care, Fred. Thank you thank so you. much. Yeah, greetings to the boys and to Paula. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.